it's a problem putting it on too early because when I'm standing there doing the attendance, I can't see anybody because I'm blinded by the, <laughs> by the can. <laughs> so we're going to continue on with the pressure reducing valves. So uh, we can use slide valves uh, and we can uh, manipulate the control edges in order to ensure that the opening gap uh, in the valve it just becomes gradually larger when you're opening so that you won't, you won't get a, a sudden total opening. Uh, so you can get a gradual opening. This is like using the chamfered uh, control edge or uh, with the notches in it, so that when you start moving it across, so you have the, you have the uh, edge of the housing and you're moving your slide across there, as soon as the notches or the chamfer reaches the edge of the housing and starts opening up, you get a gradual increase in flow until the entire piston edge has been moved off. Then you have full flow through it. So it's a way of, uh, of just uh, releasing some of the uh, flow through uh, without. And this means that we can have greater control uh, for our pressures. And uh, it means that we also get less vibration because we don't get all these very quick movements with full opening, full closing, full opening, full closing all the time. <coughs> so we have two way pressure reducing valves. And if we have a constant low pressure that we require in, in a branch of our system, uh, then we can use, uh, use a two-way pressure reducing valve. So, so for an example, if we have, we're going, uh, we have a system where something is going to be clamped uh, into the system, then uh, it might not be necessary to run full operating pressure onto the uh, cylinders that are clamping it shut. That might actually damage whatever it is you're trying to hold. For an example, uh, if we go back to the uh, logging uh, companies, when they are uh, grabbing onto uh, a tree trunk to, to hold it in place, when they are cutting off all of the branches uh, on the tree, then it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be useful for them to run at a very high pressure onto their uh, cylinders because they would start crushing the wood of the tree trunk. So then it would be useless to them, uh, that section of the tree trunk afterwards. So, so instead they can uh, manipulate it so that they get a good grip without actually destroying the wood in it. And in, in, uh, in hydraulic devices you can, you get huge amounts of powers in them. So if, if you go to YouTube and you just search for a hydraulic press in it, you will see these hydraulic presses where they can place something on, on a table and uh, a hydraulic piston will be pushing downwards on it and it will just, almost no matter what it is, it's going to totally crush it. So if you have a book uh, with a so four or 500 pages in the book, you put it on there, you put a hydraulic press on it, and if you press enough on it, it's going to be seeping lots of water out of it, and in the end, it's going to be just like wood afterwards. So you've turned it back into wood, basically, by putting it under pressure. So it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty amazing how much you can do with, uh, with hydraulics. <coughs> and they, uh, the, the two-way valves sometimes can cause a bit of a problem uh, because they don't always open up uh, when they are supposed to open up. Uh, and this has a little bit to do with the design so that it's not getting the correct, uh, correct uh, signals through the pressure. Uh, so it's sort of, if you can call it that, it's basically misinterpreting uh, the pressure that it's receiving. So it's not reducing uh, or opening up to, to reduce it uh, properly. So that, that can happen uh, sometimes, but usually you, you manage to avoid it uh, in a system like that. And you can avoid it by adding a pressure relief valve, so not a, re a reduction valve, but a pressure relief valve uh, at the output side, because then you, you uh, slow down the, uh, not, not slow down, you reduce the pressure at the A side. I'm not sure if I put in a, I didn't have that one. I'm going to go a bit backwards here to show the, the slide valve here. So, because the problem is, once you get too high of a pressure up here, at the output side of it, that pressure is going to go in here and it's going to close off the pressure uh, uh, coming from the pump. So this is going to be closed off completely if you have a high enough pressure coming in here. So the problem then is that you won't, if you remain at a too high pressure on this side, so if you're getting a load pushing on your cylinder or something, so that you're, you're, you're getting a, a pressure coming from external forces in here, uh, then it's not going to open up, so you're not going to get any flow from the pump. So it's just going to stay there, locked uh, in place. 
But if you then instead have a pressure relief valve connected to the outlet port here, that one is going to make sure that the pressure on this side can never be high enough that it's going to block off entirely the flow. So we'll just go quickly back to this one. So basically, this one would be, be the one we were just looking at uh, in the uh, cross-section view. And then you can add a pressure relief valve. So the pressure relief valve and the two-way pressure reducing valve there. And if I remember correctly, this is a bit wrong because it's supposed to look like this. Uh, so it's, uh, it's basically not correct in, uh, in the book there. Uh, because this one is supposed to be open, and if it gets too high of a pressure on this side, it's going to push the slide so that it closes off, so it won't get any, any flow through, uh, through it. <coughs> but then if the pressure remains too high here, it's going to just keep it closed off, so that's why we have connected another pressure relief valve on this side, because this one reacts at the inlet port. If it gets a high enough pressure here, it's going to push the slide and open up so that we get a return to tank. And that way we would reduce the pressure and this one will open up again so that we get the, the spring force there will be strong enough to push the slide back so that you get an opening. <coughs> and then we'll continue on the pressure reducing valves. Uh, so for adjusting this one, you can set the pressure relief valve to a greater value than the pressure reducing valve. So if we have, uh, this one will open at a higher pressure than uh, where this one closes. So for an example, if we are reducing the pressure down to, to uh, 120 bars, so this one will close off once it reaches 120 bars on this side of the system. And then maybe we have this one opening at 130 bars. So that we need to have 10 bars more than the close off value for this one before we have the pressure relief opening. That means that we need, we need to, um, uh, in order for this uh, sort of safety mechanism to, to kick in, uh, we need to apply quite a lot of external force uh, in, in this case. We could also have them set to the same value, so that if this one is set to close off at 120 bars, then this one is going to open at 120 bars. So that as soon as this one is fully closed, this one will open up, and then you will have, have a, a nice safety feature there. But you could also set this one to an even lower pressure, but that would basically mean that uh, the pressure reducing valve will never fully close itself because you will be sending pressure back to the tank before you ever reach the level where this one will close off. So there are different ways of, of setting up this uh, in order to, to get it to work. Uh, and it will basically, as we say, different settings will give you different effects in your system. So if you never want this one to go, uh, go all the way shut, it can throttle down the flow a bit, but it's never going to stop the flow completely. Then you set the uh, relief valve to a, a lower uh, pressure. <coughs> yeah, and this is a system that you can use, but the, it's very seldomly used in actual practice because you usually use more complicated valves instead to, to, to perform this action. So instead of combining two simple valves to, uh, to gain an effect, you would rather use a more complicated valve to, to ensure that you get the same effect in it. <coughs> so we have three-way pressure reducing valves also. So here you can see we have added another port in it. We have the pressure coming in, and we have the A side going to the components, but we've also added uh, a return line to the tank. So this one has the built-in feature that we were looking at here. So instead of having these two valves performing this action, you can have one valve performing the entire thing. So that's why these are, uh, are more common uh, to be used. <coughs> so when and the flow is going here from, from the pressure side and out to the components, it is identical to, to what we were looking at with a two-way uh, pressure reducing valve. It's doing exactly the same. It's uh, letting a flow from the pump pass into the components and it's reading off the pilot pressure on this side of the piston. 
But when the pilot pressure here rises to, uh, to the specified pressure, it's going to start moving the slide. And then after a while, the control edge here, it will block off the pressure side completely so that no pressure will, uh, will, be, will be added to the system. No flow will go through there. And then if the pressure up here increases even further, the slide will also move even further. And then it's going to open up uh, uh, flow from, from the components and into the tank. So you, you get the same effect here. Again. And then you can, uh, by, by using different overlap settings here, you can achieve the exact same thing as we did in the previous slide by setting different uh, opening pressures for, for the two different valves. So here, by having a, a positive overlap here, that will be the same as setting the pressure relief valve to a higher value than this pressure reducing valve, because then we will block off the pressure, but we won't open up the tank until we get an even higher pressure on the component side. But if we use uh, no overlap at all, so zero overlap, then as soon as we block off uh, the pressure, we are just about to open up to the tank. So then it just needs to move uh, a micrometer uh, a micrometer further this way, and then it's going to start opening up the flow to the tank. So then it will go more or less instantly. So that would be the same as setting the two valves in the previous slide to the exact same value. And if we have a negative overlap in the middle here, it's going to be uh, like setting the pressure relief valve to a lower value than the reducing one because then it's going to start allowing flow going back to the tank before it has closed off uh, the flow coming from the pump. Because then this, this slide part, it won't reach all the way from this control edge to that control edge. So there will be a gap between on both sides when it ends up in the middle there. <coughs> yeah, so that was the overlap I just talked about. And in the two way, you, you can adjust the overlap in, in your slide just as you want to, but you have to combine it with a pressure relief valve in order to gain the same effect as you do from adjusting the overlap in a three-way valve. So now we're going to look a bit at a uh, pressure regulator valve here. So this is a kind of valve where you can easily rebuild it to, to either act as a pressure reducing valve or you can exchange some of the components and it's going to act as a, a, a pressure relief valve. And for some reason we don't have sound here. Just going to stop it a bit and check that I have, don't have sound here. That was the reason. GF piping systems' new pressure regulating valves provide maximum performance thanks to their compact and modular design. Pressure reduction is simplified by the type 582 reducing valve. If the output pressure exceeds the set pressure, the medium is diverted over the bore channels to the diaphragm, which it presses upwards together with the piston. The valve closes until a new balance is reached. Fluctuations in the input pressure are reduced to a constant level. The valve creates a set pressure reduction in the whole system and protects sensitive equipment from excess pressure. Constant system pressure is no problem with the type 586 retaining valve. If the input pressure exceeds the set pressure, the medium is diverted over the bore channels to the diaphragm, which it presses upwards together with the piston. The valve opens and the pressure is vented. The valve then closes again until the inlet pressure equals the set pressure. Pressure surges are diverted through the valve. 
This maintains a constant input pressure. The retaining valve can also be used to create a constant line pressure to prevent pump runout, for example. The directional arrow makes it easy to use. Once set, the new valve maintains a stable set pressure. Arrows on both sides of the valve show the direction of flow. A pressure gauge can be installed on either side. Installation is simplified by the integrated threaded insert. The pressure regulating valves are available with different end connections, for example, as true union, which can be used to connect to different standards and materials. Double nested springs ensure precise pressure control and allow exact configuration of the valve to differing pressure ranges. One body, two functions. The required valve function can be selected by a simple cartridge exchange. The cartridge design also reduces maintenance costs for this low maintenance valve. Simple, reliable, flexible. GF Piping Systems New Pressure Regulating Valves. There you can see the, uh, the effect of using a modular system. So basically you could dismantle the valve and then you could replace one part, the piston part inside it, and then you suddenly had uh, a different uh, use of the valve. So then you had converted it from a pressure reducing to a pressure relief or vice versa. So it's, uh, it, that's, <coughs> that's a very, uh, very good design principle to use to have uh, a modular system where you can easily uh, switch the function of your device by exchanging one or two components, basically. So it's a, uh, whenever you are in a situation where you're designing something, if you can make that happen, where it's going to be easy to, to uh, switch the function uh, by switching one component or two or maybe even three, so then that's, uh, that's a really good selling point to, uh, to many, uh, many uh, customers basically because it's going to be cheaper to, uh, to do maintenance and uh, everything because you have more parts to choose from. So we're now going to start looking at directional control valves. So up until now we've seen them, we've seen the symbols inside our circuit diagrams, but we haven't really looked at how they work. So they still use the slide or puppet valve principles, but almost all directional control valves use the slide principle. If they're uh, a, a puppet valve type, they're usually just either uh, open or closed. So that's usually the directional function. You can't really choose that uh, you're going to send flow to this side of the cylinder or to that side of the cylinder with one puppet valve. Then you will have to have uh, a series of puppet valves to, to create such a system. Well, with a slide valve, you can make that more simple. So that's uh, the function of them is to change open or close flow paths uh, in the hydraulic systems. So depending on how you have uh, designed the control edges of your slide, you can change it by, by ch uh, changing the uh, uh, cross-sectional area for the flow so that you can basically throttle down or throttle up the, uh, the flow. And if you do it, uh, move it all the way over, you will either open it fully or close it fully uh, in the end. So uh, that's the main, main function of, uh, of directional control valves. And they follow, so that's what's being used in this book. And the main functions is activating and shutting off hydraulic energy to components in the, uh, in the system, or basically to, to entire branches of the system also. And control of motion that is executed by components, whether it's rotating motion from a motor or whether it's uh, linear motion from, uh, from cylinders, it's uh, meant to control it. So with a, with a directional control valve, 
you can choose to extend the piston or you can choose to retract it in, in the cylinder so that you, you, have, uh, you have more control over your system by using this. And it's starting and stopping flow, changing the flow directions, basically, and that's basically what you do with a cylinder. Instead of sending, uh, sending fluid into the piston chamber, you're sending fluid into the piston rod chamber so that you're making it go the other way. <coughs> and there are two types that we're looking at. It's the continuously working types, which have usually two end positions, and they have any number of intermediate positions. So we're going to look a bit more at this with the symbols, but the symbols are usually these boxes. Where they have different kinds of uh, arrows in them showing where the flow is going for the different, uh, different positions. And the point here is with having uh, two N positions, it means that it has this box and this box. That's a minimum. It has to have two boxes because it has two positions to go in. But then depending on how you've constructed it, you can have any number of intermediate switching positions. So you don't necessarily need to have just one box in the middle there or no boxes there. You can have two or three or four or five boxes. So you can put in quite a lot of different, uh, different functions in, in a valve. Usually they're restricted to two, three, and four. Uh, boxes, but you, you can end up looking at systems that have, uh, have uh, crazy looking valves sometimes. So. And these also include proportional and servo valves, but we're going to look at those later on in a later chapter. So, so those are more advanced types of directional control valves, and they come in at, in a later chapter. So just uh, this is just to make you aware of that there are other types of uh, directional control valves. And then we have the binary directional control valves, which have a fixed number of switching positions. So they have basically, this is all that's going to happen. If they have three, uh, three positions, this is all that's going to happen. While the, the continuous ones, there you can basically just slide it gently over and it's going to change as you're sliding it. So, so you, you'll get a more better feel for it when we're looking at the proportional and servo valves, how they exactly work. But with the binary directional control valves, they look uh, like the ones that we have already looked at. When you're sliding, uh, when you're moving the slide into a new position, uh, depending on your overlap, you are going to basically more, more or less instantly move it from this to that function. So, so you get, get this uh, very direct uh, switching between uh, between the functions of it. And these are usually just called wave valves. So you're going to put uh, a couple of numbers in front of there. So if uh, the first number is usually, it's not usually, it's always the amount of ports that we have. So if we have a four port, that means that we will have an A port, a B port, a pressure port, and a tank port, so we have four ports. So then we can connect four different hoses to, uh, to the valve. And then in this case, it's going to be a three because it has three positions. So it has three boxes that we can uh, pick from when we are switching. And then it's just a way Oops. valve. So we'll, we'll be getting uh, more into detail about all of this uh, in, in the uh, next presentation that we'll start looking at. And they're always depicted like this in accordance with what they are, uh, what they are able to deliver. So if, if it's a, it's a, if it's a four three way valve, it will look like this. It will have four ports and it will have three, uh, three squares uh, to choose from. So a two two-way valve means that it has only two ports, so it will only have an A port and a pressure port. It doesn't have a return to tank or, or a secondary component port. And it only has two, two, uh, two different positions to choose from. And that's basically a, a, um, a pressure relief valve it will work like that. So it has flow going from one side to the other side, and then you can either have it closed or you can have flow going. 
Then you have a 3-2 wave valve, which would look more like, uh, do I have the eraser here? There it is. It would look more like this, where you have pressure coming in, you have the, uh, uh, the components on one side, and then you have a tank uh, where, you're allowing the, where you can allow the flow to go back to tank. And also you have the four two-way, where you are looking at two boxes, and you have all four, four of the uh, ports in them. And the four three-way, which we have here, And we divide these directional valves into different uh, modes of operation, so that if it's a, a throttling valve, we can use them as that. Uh, we can have them as non-throttling, so basically how you have your, contr uh, your control edges uh, designed in, in the slide. And we subdivide them into different designs, if it's a slide valve or if it's a puppet valve. As I said, the puppet valve will only have it will only have two functions, open or closed, basically. And how you are mounting them and connecting them. So you can have a surface-mounted one, or you can have a cartridge one. So it depends a bit on how you are looking at them. So some of the valves are like the one we just saw in the animation, where you basically have everything contained in one housing, and you are connecting. Uh, your pipes to it. Other valves are meant to be placed as cartridges inside a central housing where you have one house where you can put several cartridges in and then you can connect loads of uh, uh, hoses or pipes to it so that you can have one block of housing can perform many different uh, tasks since it has different cartridge valves inside it. And that's a very, a very compact way of building a system. If you can get everything built into one housing, you're, you're going to uh, save a lot of room in it. But it also becomes more expensive because you can't use shelf stock. So, so you can't use uh, valves that are on, uh, available on the shelf of, of your uh, suppliers. You can get cartridges from them, but you can't get the housing. The housing you will have to custom design and have custom built uh, for your purpose. So then it depends, is this a one-off project for a customer or is it a product that you're going to, going to sell to potentially to thousands of customers? If it's a product that you're going to sell, then, it's, uh, then you can get, get, an, uh, uh, get a, delivery, a delivery agreement with uh, the manufacturer so that they can create uh, enough of these housings so that you get a, a good price for them. Uh, but if it's just one project where you're creating this once for one customer, then a surface-mounted one would be uh, much better to use uh, economically. So when we are selecting valves, we de determine the valve type uh, on by uh, looking at the application that we're going to use it uh, for, and also the uh, performance of it in event of power failure. Because if we have a valve that has to be manually operated, no matter how you're going to switch it, you have to manually operate it. Then if you have a power failure, then you can go in and manually operate it. That's not a problem. But often you want it to react instantly if something happens. For an example, if it loses, uh, loses its activation, so if the guy that's activating it, pushing the lever in, suddenly walks away, lets go of the lever, you might want a spring in there that pushes it back so that it closes off uh, if it's a valve that uh, is closed in its neutral position. So that's, uh, that's the part with the required performance in the event of power failure. It's just w what's going to happen to the valve when no one is looking. So what, what's its base position? Is it going to return to its base position or is it go just going to stay open and allow flow through the entire system? And we also look at uh, the requirements that the valve has to, uh, has to meet. And we, of course, want the lowest overall costs. So we go through manufacturer's catalogs. If uh, Sun Hydraulics can deliver a 4-3 uh, way directional valve cheaper to us than what Parker does, then of course we're going to go with Sun. But if uh, we're going to have several valves, then maybe Parker has a better 
better yeah. package price for us than what Sun has. So it's, uh, you, you really have to look at different manufacturers when, when you're trying to choose stuff. So bo both to look at individual cost of valves uh, and for that matter in the components of a hydraulic system, but also to look at, at, uh, at the total package because often you can uh, get into contact with the, uh, with the manufacturer and they're going to say like, well, if you're going to buy uh, a package of components that will cost more than $1,000 in total, then you'll get a 10% discount on it. If, you're, if you pass $10,000, you get a 30% discount because they know that they're going to make money on you anyway. Uh, so it's often a good way of, of, of doing it is try to get package prices for, for our stuff. But one thing that we have to keep in mind then, it's, it's not only the purchasing costs of the valve that's important to look at, but also uh, how much is it going to cost to operate it, to install it, to, uh, to maintenance it, and even replace it if, uh, or replace parts of it if, if it's uh, destroyed. So, and also with a warehousing, because if this is for a project that's a bit uh, forward in time, so, so, so you might not need these parts right off, so you'll have to keep them in a warehouse until you need them. But you want to make sure that your supplier uh, is able to give it and them to you in time. You might just want to have them stay there for a couple of months in the warehouse, just to be on the safe side. You know you have them, instead of coming there right before you really need them and then they're not available anymore. Or you have to wait for eight more weeks to get it or something like that. That is often the case when you are, uh, are uh, going to going to order stuff that's not uh, available in, uh, in the manufacturer's warehouse, you will often have to think 8, 12, 16 weeks uh, ahead of time um, in order to make sure that, that you'll get it. That is usually a, 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 um, the purchasing uh, department's uh, uh, job to, to, to look at, but, uh, but it's nice to have that in mind when you're designing stuff. If, it, if you're talking with a manufacturer anyway to get the performance characteristics uh, of a valve or a component, then just ask them also, is this something that you have in stock? Can I rely on getting this fairly quickly? Is it just for you to send it to me and then I have it? Or do I have to wait for you to actually produce it? So that's a, um, because not everything they have in their catalogs is available on stock uh, at all times. So I've, I've been burnt by that one myself, talking to their engineers and figuring out that, well, we can use this uh, this motor. But then when we, uh, when we uh, ordered it, we figured out that the flange that we were going to use, that we had chosen the flange option for, for, uh, for mounting our motor uh, to our design, that was something that they didn't keep in stock. <laughs> so that even though the motor itself was something that, uh, that was kept in stock, that particular option of motor wasn't in stock. So then suddenly we had to wait, instead of getting it in a matter of a week, uh, I think it was from Denmark it was going to be sent, so three to four days of, of transportation. Then we had to wait, I think it was nine weeks in total for, for them to actually produce uh, this uh, motor. So it was a, a bit of a setback, but then we had already produced our parts uh, that were going, so we really needed to have that flange. We couldn't, re uh, uh, we couldn't just scrap what we already have and, uh, and change the design. Yeah, so, so that's, th there's a lot of stuff you have to think about, not just the, the cost of, of the component itself. So for Wednesday, we were supposed to know how switching overlap works and the effects of it. And we were going to learn about control edges and how we could use those to our advantage in the design to, to get different effects. And we're going to learn more about pressure regulators and how they work and in particular about pressure relief valves, and also in particular about pressure reducing valves, which we have looked at today. And we were to become a little bit familiar with directional control valves. And we had a couple of clips that we looked at, and then we're going to start with the next presentation. Uh, the relief valve is basically if you get a too high pressure in to the valve, then it's going to open up 
and, and release that pressure. While the reducing valve looks at if you have a too high of a pressure going out of the valve, then it's going to close the valve. So one of them opens up if it gets too much pressure, pressure and the other one closes if it gets too much pressure. So, so one of them is protecting, one of them is protecting uh, like the pump from, from running at a too high, uh, too high of a pressure so that it opens up when the pressure gets too much and it releases fluid back to tank. While the other one protects uh, components that doesn't necessarily manage to run at the full system pressure. So the pump is maybe delivering 200 bars into the entire system, but then you have in a small section of the system, you need 150 bar to, to the components that are running there. So then you would reduce it down so that as soon as you have more than, uh, more than uh, 150 bar passing through uh, the pressure reducing valve, then it's going to close off so, so that it's not allowing more, uh, more pressure to get in there. Was that a good enough answer? <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll go through the learning goals at least before we do a break. So we're going to get to know how different directional control valve designs work. We're going to look, look more into detail how, how both the symbols work and how the, the, uh, the effect of the valve is. We're going to become familiar with uh, different connection options uh, for the directional control valves. And we're going to become familiar with actuation methods uh, for the valves. And we're going to get to know how solenoid actuated directional control valves work. We've already talked a little bit about solenoid valves in uh, subsea technology. But we're going to look more into it here. So we're going to get more familiar with it. We're going to know the results of a power failure for different types of solenoid valves. So the solenoid valves are the electrical ones where you are controlling them with electrical signals. And considering a power failure then, if you have a power loss, so, so uh, nothing is delivering signals to your valve, what's going to happen to the valve? So then it depends on, on the design of the valve, exactly what, how it's going to behave. And we're going to become familiar with two two-way valves and three two-way valves. And uh, we'll just do this slide before we do a break. So this is the first one we're going to look at. So we have this symbol. So we have two ports. So it's a, uh, it's a two-way valve. And we have two switching positions. So it's a two-two-way valve. Directly actuated. And it's a two-two-way. And it's directly actuated because our, our hand lever valve over on uh, our hand lever over on the side here, it's directly connected to the slide. So when we are pushing, when we are pushing the hand lever over in this direction, we are also switching. So we, then we are physically moving the slide inside the valve. So that's why it's directly actuated. And it also has what is called the detent. So basically what that one does is that it uh, uh, creates a force that is basically holding the position for you. So that if you push the hand lever in, then it's going to stay in the, that position once you, once you let go of the, the hand lever. And then you have to manually grab the hand lever and pull it back if you're going to have it in the other direction. So my own way of uh, remembering this is a, a, a detent. I just think about uh, American high school movies and they're being put in detention and have to stay back at school uh, after after hours. So, so it, it basically just puts the lever in, in the tension, so it's, it keeps, keeps its position. And these are just used for shutting off, uh, shutting off or opening uh, the, the flow directly. And you could run an analogy to, uh, to a road, basically with traffic going in, in two directions. So you have uh, traffic from the pump coming in this direction, and you have traffic coming from, uh, from the component in the other direction. And when we have it in its uh, neutral position, then it's blocked off. So both sides have a red light, so there's no traffic coming at all. And then when we activate it with our hand, 
then both sides get a green light and uh, they can both go. So if you have a higher pressure coming from the pump, you will have traffic coming this way. But if you have a higher pressure in your components, it's going to move back towards the pump. So in this case, uh, you would have, have to have other valves there in order to save your pump from, uh, from uh, getting too much of a back pressure coming back if, if that was uh, a potential in this situation. And then, if you activate the lever once more, you switch it back to red lights, so then you shut it off again. So then we'll do a break and we'll uh, look at some uh, more valves afterwards.
Okay, then we'll uh, go on to the next valve and look at it. And here we also have uh, two switching positions to choose from, but we have three ports. So it's a three two way valve. And this one is a solenoid valve. So this is the symbol that is used to show that it's being controlled by, uh, by electrical signals. And it also also has a spring return. So we've placed a spring symbol in this to show that it's going to, if you, if you stop supplying electrical energy to it, then it's going to just be pushed back by the spring. So you don't, um, you don't have to uh, deliver electrical energy in two directions to get it. You only have to activate it with the electrical energy uh, to get it to switch. And if you want it to switch back, you just cut off the electrical energy and then the spring is going to move it back. And these are often used for single acting linear cylinders and for activating or shutting off hydraulic fluid uh, in flows. And uh, we can still use the traffic example for this one, even though it has uh, three ports. So we can imagine a, an intersection like this. But here we are also saying that we can't have any fluid coming from the tank and we can't have any fluid going from the from the component and back to the pump. So if any fluid is going to come back from the component, it's going to take a, a turn and go to the tank. And the fluid from the pump is going to go straight out uh, to the components. So that's these, these arrows here. Uh, so if it's going from the pump and straight up, then it's going right up here. Or if we are switching it to this position, then it's going to, to take a turn. <coughs> So, if we have blocked off the pump and we're allowing fluid to turn back into the tank, that means that in a normally closed valve, that's going to be in the neutral position. So then it's activated by the spring. But in a normally open valve, we will have to supply electrical current in order for it to, uh, to uh, achieve this switching position, because then it has to move the slide over so that this is the one that uh, counts. And then if we switch around to, to uh, uh, allow the spring to do its work on uh, the lower valve, and then we activate the upper valve with uh, electric current, then we are going to block off the flow from the component, and we're going to open up the flow from the, from the pump and into the component. Then we'll get over to a bit more complex, Stuff. Now we have four ports, so we have a four two-way valve, four ports and two different positions. And this one also has a hand lever to be operated, and it has a spring return, so that if you push the hand lever and then release it, it's going to, uh, to bounce back again. And these are usually used for double-acting linear cylinders. So basically it means that if we just let it uh, uh, let the pump flow, it's going to push the cylinder in one direction. And then if we activate the hand lever, then it's going to push the cylinder in the other direction. So it's going to reverse the flow direction for the cylinder. And now we can't look at, uh, look at a, a traffic analogy anymore. Now we just have to start looking at where are the flow is going. Because having four ports it becomes, uh, would be, uh, become a very complex traffic intersection if you're <laughs> going to look at that. So, so instead, we're just going to look uh, directly at the flows. So when we are not operating the hand lever, the spring is in action. So the spring is pushing the slide into its uh, neutral position. And then we had flow coming from the pump and going to the B side uh, of the, uh, of the uh, components. So maybe the B side here would be, uh, be the piston rod side, so that in this position it would uh, retract the piston rod uh, fr uh, from the cylinder. And then the A side would be connected to the uh, piston chamber so that it would be emptied of hydraulic fluid, sending it back to the tank. And then if we activate it, and we keep activating it, so we have to actually hold uh, the lever in place. Then our flow is going to go from the pump and up to the piston chamber. 
and we are going to have flow coming from the piston rod chamber and back into the tank. So now the piston rod will be advancing out of the cylinder because it will be pushed uh, from the piston side. Then if we let go of the hand lever, it's going to switch back. So then we will be retracting the cylinder again. So we will have a flow going to the, to the piston rod chamber and flow coming from the piston chamber so that it will be pulling the load back again. Then we'll look at the next one. So here we have a really complex one looking at. We have four ports, we have three positions, we have solenoid symbols on both sides and springs on both sides. So this is a very complicated one. So it's a four three way well, uh, and it has solenoids and spring returns on both sides. So this means that uh, if we're not applying any current to any of the solenoids, it's just staying there on the, on the springs. So since we have one, one spring on each side, and these springs will deliver the same amount of force, so that means that it's going to stay in the uh, middle position. So that, that's going to be the neutral position. When, when we're not supplying any electrical current to it, the springs will make sure that it stays in this neutral position, which in this case is completely closed. We'll look at that uh, in a bit. And these are often used for double acting linear cylinders where you are going to be able to stop the cylinder in the middle of movement. So instead of constantly having it move back or forth, like uh, the previous one where we saw, because no matter how we switched our valve, it would always deliver flow from the pump. In this one, we can let it return to the neutral position and then it's going to stop because no fluid is going to be able to return from the cylinder and no fluid is added to the cylinder either. <coughs> uh, and then you have uh, several other ways of doing it, uh, uh, traversing circuits, inhibition circuits, or special requirements for performance if there is a power failure. So in this is one which is very nice to have uh, if you are uh, afraid that something's going to happen in a power failure. So the previous one in a power failure, it would retract the, uh, the uh, piston because the, the power in that case was our hand uh, moving the, the lever. So if our worker had to run off to go to the bathroom or, or something like that, uh, he had to let go of the lever and then it was going to return the piston. So most likely uh, that would be an okay situation uh, in, in that case. But here you might have a serious situation happening if you lose electrical power. And then it's nice to know that everything is just going to stop because the, piston, uh, the, uh, the springs will return your slide to the central position, which is the neutral one in this case, and it's going to stop all of the flow. So, so basically, if you lose your power, uh, your electrical power, your hydraulic system is also going to stop directly. So nothing is going to, to, to happen. If you, have a, if you have a cylinder that's been, uh, been moving uh, outwards, it's been extending the piston rod, and it hasn't reached its end position yet, but you get a power failure, then it's just going to stop there. And it's going to stay also because bo both of these ports are closed off, so they're not going anywhere. The, the fluid that's inside the piston chamber and the fluid that's inside the piston rod chamber, it's trapped in there, so it's, it's not getting anywhere. So, so that the, the, uh, the cylinder itself won't have any more movement. And that can be a, uh, be a, a good a fail-safe situation uh, if you have a power failure, so that make sure that nothing is going to happen. For an example, this can be a some sort of uh, press uh, or something, and then you would just want it to stop so that n a person won't be able to end up inside the press and be killed by it, or something like that if it just runs rampant. So in this neutral position, we're getting no flow from the components. The pressure is just just shoving against the slide valve, the piston on the, on, on the slide uh, inside the valve, so it's just it doesn't get anywhere, it doesn't have any openings to, to go through. And for the tank, there is nothing coming from anywhere. That one is also completely blocked off. So then if we activate one side, we can see that then if we activate on this side, this is the symbol that we're going to look at. And then we will have pressure flowing from the pump and to the B side, um, to the B port which uh, if we use the same setup as we used on the previous slide, that would be to the piston rod chamber so that it would attract 
uh, the cylinder. And we're allowing the pressure, uh, the hydraulic fluid inside the piston chamber to return to tank so that we can move, move the piston rod into the cylinder again. Then if we switch around, we release the, the uh, electric current that we're giving it. It's going to bounce back into the neutral position uh, because of the springs on each side. And then we can activate this side. And then we're going to push the slide over this way, so it's going to be, be this symbol that tells us what's going to happen. And then we have flow going from the pump and to the piston chamber on the cylinder. And the fluid in the piston rod chamber is going to go back to tank so that the piston rod is being extended from the cylinder. We, uh, we release the electric current. We don't apply it anymore. And then it returns back to its neutral position. What happens if we put electrical currents on both sides? Well, nothing happens because you get the same effect as you get from the springs. You have the same amount of force pushing on both sides, so nothing really happens. Nothing is going to move. <coughs> it, it could be a problem, of course, uh, if you do this. So you could end up burning out the, the circuits. So you could burn out your electrical circuits this way because they will both be fighting to get, uh, to get be able to, uh, to activate uh, the the uh, valve, but nothing is happening. So that will just keep on uh, developing heat from, uh, from the current uh, going through the system. So it's not, it's not a good situation, but if you just accidentally put some current to both of them, and then you, uh, you switch it off again because you noticed what you did, then it's not going to destroy anything and the, the valve hasn't moved at all. <coughs> now we're going to see another one that has a bypass position on it. So the, the side switching positions, those are, remain the same. So it's only the neutral position here that's been changed. So we're only going to look at that one. So what happens here is that we get full flow going from the pump and back to the tank. So it just sends it in a loop, basically. So if this is the first directional control valve you have in your system, it means that your, your, uh, the, the fluid coming directly from your pump is just going to go straight back into your tank, so in a, in a full loop. And many systems are created in this way because they want, they want the pump to keep on running. It's not going to, to start building up pressure by, by go coming to a blocked port, like in, in the previous example. Uh, so then they just want the pump, uh, want the pump to, uh, to rather just continue flowing continually, just keep the hydraulic fluid flowing, which could be, uh, be, be positive, uh, especially if you have a return filter on your uh, system, because when you're not, uh, when you're not actuating uh, the valve, when you're just in your neutral position, you're not running your cylinder or anything, then you're actually running your hydraulic fluid through the filter constantly, so, so that you're constantly cleaning up your, your fluid. So, uh, so it can be a, a nice uh, design to use. But you have to remember that your pump is going to be running continually. It's, it's never going to, to, to have any breaks uh, in that kind of way. <coughs> Another one, uh, uh, which is a possibility, is to have a floating position, as it's called, which means that you are adding pressure to both sides of the piston in the, uh, in the uh, cylinder. And then it depends on the cylinder, because if you have a cylinder which which uh, has a differential uh, surface area ratio, so that if it has, for an example, twice as much surface area on the, uh, uh, in the piston chamber side as it has in the piston rod chamber side, then it's going to move outwards in this case. Because uh, even though you are applying the same amount of pressure to both sides, you are still getting more force on the side uh, with the most uh, surface area. But if you have one of these where you have equal, you have a one-to-one -one surface area ratio, where you basically have a piston rod going through the entire cylinder with the piston in the middle, then you're going to be able to, you're, you're running full pressure on both sides, but you're going to be able to go over and push on your piston rod. And you can push it in and you can pull it out because it, it has the same, uh, sa same um, 
uh, amount of force on each side. So whatever force you are applying to the edge of the piston rod, pushing it in or pulling it out, it's going to overcome the, the equilibrium that's inside uh, the cylinder. <clears throat> and then you have another way of doing this, is to just open both of the ports back to the tank. And that's going to, to end up with the same, that you can go over and manually move your piston, uh, your piston rod uh, for the cylinder. So that one is also floating, but, but then you're, you don't have any pressure going through your system, so you're closed off your pump. <clears throat> so then we're going to look at uh, a four two-way valve, so four ports and two switching positions. And it has a double solenoid valve, but it doesn't have any, any uh, springs attached to it. It has a detent in order to, to remain in one position, which means that once you have placed, switched it over the one position, it means that you need more force to get it moving again than you need to actually keep it moving. Uh, so that you need to overcome a certain amount of force before it starts moving. <coughs> and they're used for double acting uh, cylinders or for motors. And here we get in the neutral position, we get full flow from the pump and to, uh, to the uh, piston chamber, uh, if we're still using the cylinder. And on the piston rod chamber, we're getting full flow back to the tank. So that we will be extending uh, the cylinder piston. So then if we activate on one side, we're going to switch over. And we have the detent that goes into place and it's going to keep it there. So it's going, uh, going to make sure that it stays in place. So even though you would be uh, dropping the electrical current there, it's still going to hold that position. And then you switch around. So you, you put uh, your pressure into the B port and into the pressure rod chamber and uh, into the piston rod chamber. And from the piston chamber, you're allowing full flow back to tank so that you will be retracting your cylinder. <coughs> and then we put uh, the power back on to the other side, so we're going to switch it over to the other side, and then we get it back. So in this case, we actually need to apply power. Either way, when we're going to move it, uh, to, to, to switch the valve, we need to have power on one of the sides. <coughs> so the problem here is that if we start applying power to both sides, in this case, where we don't have these springs and we don't have three positions to choose from, then we're going to end up pushing it into a middle position and we're not get really getting it, we're not managing to s uh, switch it into the correct position. So it's going to stay somewhere in the middle and it's not going to manage to, uh, to get there. In this case, most likely, since we have the detent there, that's going to be enough to make sure that uh, the power you are applying on, uh, on this side is going to the power here combined with the, the, the force from the detent is going to be enough to overcome uh, the power on the other side. So in this particular case, it might be okay, but it might still be a problem uh, uh, running it. So, so it's, uh, in cases like this, it's not good to have, uh, have solenoids on both valves, uh, on both sides without having some sort of backup system for, for moving it. <coughs> then we're going to look at an animation. Directional control valves are used to stop, start, route, and divert fluid streams without affecting the pressure level or the flow rate of the system. Directional control valves are identified by the number of ways that fluid can flow and the number of positions the valve can produce. A way refers to the number of active porting connections called ports. This valve has three ports, so it is a three-way valve. The term position refers to the number of discrete operating positions of the internal valve element. For this spool valve, one position allows fluid to flow from the inlet to port A, and a second position allows fluid to flow from the inlet to port B. Therefore, this is a two-position valve. This spool valve has two ports and two positions. The first position allows fluid to flow freely. The second position blocks both ports. 
Even though both ports aren't physically blocked, the lack of fluid entering the pressure port also prevents fluid from exiting outlet port A. Therefore, both ports are defined as blocked, making it a two-way, two-position valve. To simplify fluid system drawings and schematics, all valves can be represented graphically. Boxes, sometimes called envelopes, are used to indicate the number of valve positions. Since this is a two-position valve, its graphic representation has two adjacent boxes. Continuous lines are used to indicate fluid flow between ports. For complex valves, the ports may also be labeled. The input port is typically labeled P for pressure. Outlet ports are typically given alpha characters starting with A. Other times, the letter stands for the destination of the fluid. For instance, the letter T would indicate a port that is connected to a tank. This is a fairly simple valve, so port labels are not required. A solid arrow indicates the direction of liquid flow. The first position of this valve allows fluid to flow from the pressure port to port A, so an arrow is drawn in the first box to indicate fluid flow. A T indicates that a port or way is blocked or closed. This valve's first position has no ports blocked, but its second position blocks both. The second box corresponds to the second position of the valve. Therefore, two T's are added to illustrate the lack of fluid flow in the second position. Next, lines are drawn to indicate the normal position of the valve. The normal position is defined as the position of the valve when its spool is unshifted and the power is off. This means that any mechanical actuators, such as springs, are in their non-actuated positions. Electrical actuators, such as solenoids, are powered off. The normal position can sometimes be referred to as the unshifted, de-energized, or unactuated position. In this case, position 1 is the normal position. Therefore, the lines to indicate the normal position are drawn in the first box. On a hydraulic schematic, the lines that indicate the normal position will be connected to other devices in the system. Valves that do not have mechanical or electrical actuators do not have a normal position because they must be manually moved. When shifted, they remain in that state until manually shifted to another position. The terms normally opened and normally closed are used to describe the condition of a valve when it is in the normal position. For this valve, the normal position is position 1, which allows unrestricted fluid flow through the open ports. Therefore, this valve is a normally opened valve. Additionally, this valve is a spring return valve, meaning that after it is actuated, a spring returns the spool to the normal position. A spring symbol is placed next to the block representing the normal position. Actuators used to change valve positions can be mechanical, pneumatic pilot, or electric solenoid. To complete the diagram, the primary actuator symbol is placed on the other end of the graphic symbol. In this case, the actuator is a push button. Mechanical actuators change valve positions with springs, push buttons, plungers, levers, and cam rollers. Pneumatic pilots change valve position with a pressured air signal. Electric solenoids that change valve positions by directly moving the valve element are called direct solenoids. Electric solenoids that open small pilot valves and allow pressurized air to move the valve element are called solenoid-controlled pilot operators. Here is a similar valve to the one previously shown. It has two ports and two positions. So it is also a two-way, two-position valve. To illustrate the differences with this valve, let's build its graphic symbol. It is a two-position valve, so the graphic symbol will have two adjacent boxes. This valve also has two ports. However, in the normal non-actuated position, both ports are blocked. Therefore, it is a normally closed valve. 
when the valve is actuated, fluid is allowed to flow from the pressure port to port A. A spring returns the valve to its normally closed position and a push button actuates it to the open position. Therefore, this valve is a two-way, two-position, normally closed, spring return, push button operated valve. While it is similar to the previous example, the differences in the normal position make it a distinctly different valve. The most important applications in fluid power for three-way valves are for directional control. Here we have a typical three-way valve with two operating positions. This valve has an inlet port P, exhaust port E, and output port A. In its normal position, inlet port P is blocked and outlet port A is connected to exhaust port E. The second position allows fluid to flow from the pressure port P to outlet port A and blocks exhaust port E. The valve is also spring return and push button operated. Here is another three-way, two-position valve. This valve also has an inlet port P, exhaust port E, and output port A, but they are in a different configuration. In its normal position, exhaust port E is blocked and fluid flows from pressure port P to outlet port A. The second position, pressure port P, is blocked and allows fluid to flow from outlet port A to exhaust port E. The valve is also spring return and push button operated. Three-way directional control valves have many applications in fluid systems. One of the most common applications is for the control of single acting cylinders. In this application, fluid is pumped from a tank to pressure port P. With the valve in the normal position, fluid is blocked. When the valve is actuated, fluid flows from pressure port P through outlet port A to the cylinder. The cylinder extends and remains extended until the valve changes positions. When the valve de-energizes, the spool returns to position 1, pressure port P is blocked, and exhaust port E is open. The cylinder retracts and fluid flows from the cylinder through port A and out exhaust port E. From there, the fluid returns to the tank. Here's a graphical rendering of the same system using symbols as they would appear on a schematic diagram. Two and three-way control valves are ideal for use as directional control valves to operate cylinders or hydraulic rams, filling and draining tanks, as mechanical brakes, and even in vacuum systems. Their versatility is vital to the successful operation of many different fluid systems. It's always a bit nice to get to see, see it actually moving when, when you're uh, looking at it. So um, I think I've uh, forgotten to put in the, the animations on this one. <coughs> if I had had uh, a full week uh, to prepare, uh, a full workday week uh, to prepare, I would probably have created the, uh, the animations myself so that you could actually watch it while we were doing the, the lecture. But Sadly, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I would have liked to do it in order to be able to show this uh, even more properly, but luckily we can find, uh, find clips like that on, on YouTube that are very instructional, so uh, they're good to use. And of course, uh, the, the presentation will be, be uh, uh, linked to uh, on, on Fontor and also on, on the YouTube video, so that it's easy to, to follow it and, and actually go in and, and watch it again, uh, just watching the clip if you want to. <coughs> so directional control valve designs. So if we have a valve uh, with our desired, desired characteristics and it's not available basically, uh, the ports uh, can be switched around or a valve with more ports can be used. So you'll actually see this when you, uh, when you look in our lab. 
So I think uh, uh, Kenneth, one of the student's assistants, he's working on, uh, on uh, finishing off the, the uh, lab task that we're going to do. So uh, Ian Runald is working on it. And you'll actually see that uh, uh, instead of using a 4-3 uh, uh, way uh, valve like this, uh, it actually is a 6-3 way valve that's being used. But uh, some of the ports just aren't in use. So, so they're, they're blocked off or just return straight to tank uh, through them. So uh, it is possible if you don't have the correct, uh, exactly correct valve that you're going to use, you can use one with uh, even more possibilities. So you can use a more advanced valve to, to create your, uh, your more simple functions. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, that's always a possibility. So if you have something on hand that can be used. <coughs> so if we want a, a, a four two way valve to function as a two two way we, we simply have to block off two of the ports and the same if we want the four two way valve to act as a three two way we block off one of the ports so that we can uh, basically if we have the we have this one which is a four two way port and if we want it to be a two two way we will block off both both the return to tank and uh, one of the uh, one of the um, component ports, and if we want it to be a uh, a uh, three two way, we only block off one of the component ports. So then, then we will end up when we have the uh, if we have it. If we have this setup when we are switching. So what's actually happening in this case is that it is acting as if it is one where the uh, pressure port is just blocked off. Since we are blocking it off outside the valve, so we're basically just screwing in a cap there, blocking off the flow completely, then it's just going to a stop. So nothing is happening while we're using it. So that's the, the actual effect in this case. And then when we're looking at, at this side, it will be the same as just blocking off the tank because it, nothing will happen on this side uh, in the valve. So there will be, since there is nothing up here, then there will be no flow back to the tank. So the tank is practic uh, in all effects blocked off. <coughs> so that's a possibility uh, if, you have, um, if you have a warehouse filled with, uh, with different valves, none of them is the actual one that you need to use, but you have more complicated valves available, then you can, can, uh, can use those to, to achieve the same effect. <coughs> so different connection options for uh, directional valves. So for the cartridge valves, we have the ability to have uh, self-retaining screw-in valves uh, in, in, in uh, screw-in cartridges. So they are basically, you, you just screw it in uh, and it, it uh, does the rest itself <coughs> because all of the the functional elements that you need they are inside the cartridge so that you're you're uh, you're uh, well off there and you have no housing for it so you have no external housing and they're usually connected as uh, plug-in valves to a valve manifold so, so that you have a a common housing part where you put your cartridges in and then uh, you have all of your ports coming into the uh, housing and then they will go through selected cartridge valves and then they will come out uh, the specified ports on the other side of the manifold. <coughs> this, as I mentioned earlier, remains, uh, gives you a very compact hydraulic system when you're designing it. And you get minimal amounts of piping because most of the, uh, most of the fluid flow going between valves is going through bores, so internal bores inside the manifold. So the manifold is basically just a, a large slab of, of uh, steel usually, and then they've, uh, uh, then they've bored in many different holes uh, in order to create pathways inside this slab of steel. And wherever they've created a hole that's not going to be used uh, as a port, they've just blocked it off, uh, just like we did and could do uh, on the valve here. So they've just blocked off that hole, and then you have uh, suddenly connected to uh, several different holes by creating this one. If you have, uh, if we're looking at the uh, at the side of the 
of the manifold housing. If you've bored in a hole this way, and you've bored in a hole that way, and then you also bore in a hole this way, then you can just block off the top here with a just screw in a cap. So you block it off completely, and then you suddenly can have flow going this way. So you can have it uh, uh, moving in different directions. So, but that's also why, why you get a compact hydraulic system, but it usually also becomes very expensive because creating these manifold housings, although they take very little space and you, you free up a uh, quite a lot of uh, piping where you don't need external pipes and hoses to connect the valves together, then uh, it, it's still expensive to manufacture those. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fair enough if, if you're an uh, ROV company where you, you really need to have it compact inside the ROV, the valves that you're using, and you are selling several uh, ROVs uh, a month or something like that, so you're actually producing quite a lot of those. Then using this uh, uh, design like this is perfect. It's going to fulfill everything you need uh, with regards to, to, to space, uh, and you will free up more space inside the, the um, ROV for, for uh, your other internal systems. It's going to cost a little bit more, but since you're actually selling these ROVs, you'll make it up uh, f from the sales. So it's not going to be a, be a huge problem for it. But then again, if you're creating just one ROV that you're going to use f for one task, then this will be a very, very expensive way of doing it. <coughs> and then you can get various degrees of integration. So uh, I've also seen a manifold types like this where they've actually connected several manifolds together just by, by creating uh, small lengths of pipe uh, between the manifolds. So then you can have the flow going through quite a lot of different uh, stages uh, inside it. <coughs> then you have surface mounted valves, which are basically just screwed onto a, a sub base uh, and it has a sealed joining surface. So, so the, the sub base um, has its own, I gotta get the, uh, the rest uh, over here. Uh, so, so the sub base, it has a port pattern uh, with holes that are going to connect to, to, uh, uh, to the valve. Uh, and this is standardized, the patterns are standardized, how they look like. Uh, and they are specified in the ISO 4401. And the connection is actually established indirectly because you, 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 have, this, you have this base, so a flat surface, where you have holes at specific locations. And you're just going to screw this directly onto another surface where you have holes in the, uh, the uh, equivalent locations. So then you just screw it tightly and you have a, seal, a sealing ring or something inside there so that you keep it, uh, keep it airtight, or uh, pressure tight, basically not airtight. <coughs> and so instead of just connecting hoses or pipes between them, you are just putting the surfaces directly together. So there are some advantages to it, so, and that is that it, it it becomes sort of a modular system and it's going to be easy to take it apart and, and uh, either remove parts for maintenance, so, so um, cleaning them or, or something like that, but, but also if you're just going to exchange parts of the system to, to get a different function, it's going to be easier for that. <coughs> it also means that you can use valves from different manufacturers. And so that's my, uh, my experience uh, is using systems uh, like these where it doesn't really matter if you're using a valve from uh, delivered by Parker or by Sun Hydraulics because they all have uh, the ports specified. So they all created them uh, with these ports so that even though I use different valves from different manufacturers, I can still put them into the same bases. <coughs> and you get all of your ports in one single plane. So, so it's a, it's a nice, uh, nice way of doing it. So, so you get it. Uh, get all, all in one surface. And you get a flat ceiling surface there uh, between them and you, you, you can also choose to open uh, ports at different parts of, of the sub base because the sub base is basically just a small block of steel that has been uh, drilled holes into. It. So it's, a, it's a, another way of doing it. So instead of having the, a larger block where you put everything inside one block, you can have 
smaller blocks that you build together. And also you, you, you seal the ports by using, for example, O-rings, uh, which are rubber rings that you put uh, inside, uh, inside, the, inside of the threads. So on the opposite side of the threads, you have O-rings, which will seal against the surface and they, will, uh, they, they are rubber, so, so some sort of rubber usually. Uh, so they become flexible and they just get squeezed into place and then they uh, keep, it, keep it sealed. So here is uh, one of the port patterns that you can have. So here we have the hole that is going to be connected to the tank. We have the hole connected to the pump, and then we have the A and B ports that will go to, to two different parts of, uh, of our system. And here we have another one uh, where we have uh, NG6 port pattern. We have the pump, the tank, and the two different component ports. So we you can combine these two. You see these holes that are here, those are for, for running bolts through them and screwing it tight so that you can tighten it up. <coughs> and then we're going to, I think we'll do, I'll just check how long this animation is. I can't quite remember. In most yeah, we'll do this one. Hydraulic fluid power circuits, valves and then we're, are used to control we'll have a weekend. The direction, rate, and pressure in fluid lines. Control valves for these functions can be purchased with either manual or solenoid actuators. In a manually actuated valve, the internal cylinder is shifted by hand using a lever, push button, plunger, or other manual actuating device. By contrast, valves with a solenoid actuator respond to an electrical signal for shifting. With electrical control, machine cycles can be set up for automatic sequencing and operator control can be exercised from a remote location. Solenoid valves are said to be either direct or pilot operated. A direct operated valve is shown here. A pilot operated valve has a pilot and bleed orifice and utilizes line pressure for operation. This is a pilot-operated relief valve. When the solenoid is energized, the core opens the pilot orifice and relieves pressure from the top of the valve piston, or diaphragm, to the outlet side of the valve. This results in an unbalanced pressure, lifting the piston or diaphragm off the main orifice. Short pause there, because you, you remember this one from, uh, from uh, Wednesday when we were looking at this pilot-operated pressure relief valve. And then it didn't have the solenoid part. So what this means is that it's, it's a, um, basically the same kind of a valve. It can open by itself if the pressure becomes large enough. But in addition, you can activate it electrically and open it. So, so you can choose to open it if you want to relieve the pressure. So if you, if you have it set for 180 bars and you're up at 170 and for some reason you want to relieve the pressure of the system a bit, you can activate it electrically and then you're going to relieve the pressure. When the solenoid is de-energized, the pilot orifice is closed and full line pressure is applied to the top of the piston or diaphragm, closing the valve. Most directly operated valves also come in pilot operated versions and are designated by a triangular graphic symbol. A single solenoid valve has one solenoid to assist in valve operation. The valve spool shifts when the solenoid receives an electrical signal and is energized. The valve will remain shifted as long as electrical current is applied to the solenoid. Once the electrical current is removed and the solenoid is de-energized, the valve returns to its normal position by spring force. Fluid circuits designed to use single solenoid valves must maintain electrical current in order to keep the valve in its shifted position. Double solenoid valves have two solenoids, typically mounted on opposite ends of the valve body. This type of two-position double solenoid valve does not have a spring return. When the first solenoid is energized, the valve spool shifts into the first position. 
even if the first solenoid is de-energized, the spool remains shifted. This is because there is no spring to return the spool to its original position. Energizing the second solenoid will send the valve to the second position. Even if the second solenoid is de-energized, the valve will remain shifted until the first solenoid is re-energized. Since the there is nothing holding the valve in the shifted position other than friction. These types of valves should be mounted horizontally to avoid self-shift due to excessive airflow or vibration. If both solenoids are energized at the same time, the solenoids will work against each other and may cause the spool to become stuck, electrical burnout of the solenoid, or an overload of inrush current to the circuit, any of which will cause severe damage to the system or valve. A three-position valve has a spring-centered neutral position for its internal spool. Because of the centering springs, it's necessary to hold current on one solenoid or the other to keep the spool in one of its side positions. When each solenoid is energized, the valve shifts to the appropriate position. Any time both solenoids are de-energized, the valve spool will spring to center and stop the fluid flow. Therefore, a three-position valve requires a maintained electrical signal for its operation. As before, energizing both solenoids at once may cause damage to the valve or to the system. To prevent this from occurring, electrical circuits should be designed to make it impossible to have current on both solenoids at the same time. Solenoid valves are used in both hydraulic fluid and air systems to control direction on cylinders from deceleration or speed control and pump unloading or pressure control. The physical appearance of each component will vary greatly depending on brand, size, and type so care should be taken to reference the appropriate manufacturer's guidance when choosing a solenoid valve. Yeah, that was it. Then everyone, have a nice weekend.